Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. We're so excited to be here today in the Nazareth Village, which is actually in the city of Nazareth in Israel. Directly behind me is an ancient burial tomb. And I'm going to share with you a message I've never shared on Manifest. Is For that matter, I've never preached it before called Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> Don't you love it? Several years ago, we were in the city of Bethlehem and we went to the Church of the Nativity, which is the traditional church where it's believed that Christ was born, not in the church building, but in a cave that's located underneath the church. We had supported that church and helped them to build a youth facility behind the church. And so the priests were just very kind to us and they said, we'd like to show you all the building. They took me into the basement into a room that shocked me because there behind these bars in this basement of this church were hundreds and thousands of bones. And I, I noticed there was a lot of little infant bones there and you could tell they were very brittle and very old. And I said, you know, whose bones are these? And he said, well, the, some of them date back to different periods, but this is where it was discovered that the babies that were slain in Bethlehem, their bones were brought. And man, my heart just sunk when I saw that. Now, um, Constantine's mother came to the Holy Land uh, and began to mark all the different holy sites. And one of the things that really touched my heart is just to realize that if you're standing there and that is accurate, that you're actually seeing some of the infants that died and yet Christ was able to escape. Now, for a moment, let me talk to you about the tales from the crypt. We're gonna be talking about a burial tomb and we're gonna be talking about the different theories that people have relating to Jesus Christ. Did he really raise from the dead or did he not? Before we do that, let's talk about the ancient Jewish burial methods. The, back in the time of Abraham, we discovered that Abraham went to Hebron after the death of Sarah, and he went to the caves of Machpelah, and there he bought the caves, and he buried, uh, Abraham was buried there, Isaac was buried there, Jacob was buried there. You have Sarah and Leah and um, Rebecca that was buried there. The only woman not buried there among the matriarchs was Rachel, and she was buried on the road to Bethlehem. Now, when I, we went one time to those caves and basically it's a large complex, it's a large building and you don't see much there because it's, you know, it has floors that date back several hundred years, etc. But years ago, and this has been many years ago, somebody decided to go in there and see if they could find the bones of Abraham and they actually broke through a chamber underground and there was a big square stone and when they removed that stone which had not been removed in for ages they went underground and they did find where there were burial niches underneath what you where you stand today in the caves of Machpelah in Hebron there were no bones there uh, apparently the bones had been removed years ago centuries ago who knows but that is definitely where Abraham uh, Isaac and Jacob are buried in the air of Hebron now, the ancient burial, and I want to go to this tomb here because the ancient burials uh, back in the time of Jesus, that you're looking at, you're actually looking here at Nazareth Village at uh, an authentic tomb like that would have existed back in Jesus' day. Now, in Jerusalem, for example, and much of Israel, it's limestone. And these are called sepulchers. This is what, what the Bible uses in the King James translation as the sepulcher. And the sepulchers were cut out of limestone. And there's a couple features that I want you to know. Number one, in most places, this was not just a tomb for one person. We think it was just a tomb where they laid an individual and everybody had one of these. No, they were owned usually by families. And in the old ones that we have seen in Israel, this is basically what you have. When you go in, you can look to the left or to the right on, in most of these sepulchers made out of limestone. And what you will find is niches that have been carved into the stone itself, meaning that if you walk in and turn to the left, you would see a niche, a niche, a niche, a niche, one on top of the other. And you may have 10, 20, 30 on one side, 10, 20, and 30 on the other. Now let's go back for a moment because that's how the tomb was made. But let me talk about a Jewish burial for a moment. The Jewish burial back in the time of Christ was not the kind of burial we have in the West. 
In the West, when someone passes away, we embalm the body. And we do that so that the body will be preserved for the family members that may live a thousand miles away to be able to travel to have a celebration of home going if they're a believer, or we would call it a funeral. Now, in the, in the Jewish time, and this is real significant, you, I'm going to give you a nugget here. They did not embalm the body, and religious Jews do not embalm the body today. We were in Jerusalem when someone had died, and it was a Jewish leader. And in less than an hour and a half, 100,000 people were at the Western Wall, Orthodox Jewish men. Before the sun set, they had washed the body, wrapped it in a tallit, taken it in an ambulance all the way up on the Mount of Olives, and buried it before the sun set. This is what I want to tell you. Now listen. Back in the time of Jesus, this is how they buried people. You were buried within 12, no more than 24 hours. In other words, if you died in the morning, you were buried by the time the sun set. You were not embalmed. The blood remained in your body. Now, there was a Jewish belief, and one of the reasons maybe they did not embalm is there was a Jewish belief that it was possible that the spirit or soul of the person was kind of migrating around the earth or hovering over the body. And it's a possibility that in three days, it had a three-day period of time in which that soul and spirit could enter back into the body. The Jewish belief in Jesus' day, however, was that by the time the fourth day had arrived, it was impossible for the soul and spirit to come back to the body, for the soul and spirit would go to its eternal resting place, either paradise, which was known as Abraham's bosom, Luke 16, or it would go to hell. Here is the part that's amazing. Lazarus dies. Okay, they don't embalm him. This is why after four days they said, by now he's stinking because there's no embalming fluid in the man. He's buried with his blood still in his body. And so four days, especially if it was hot, I mean, when the Bible says he was stinking, I'm telling you, the man was stinking. I mean, this is the truth. But Jesus waited till the fourth day to show up at Bethany. My, my. And there's a reason that he waited for the fourth day, because he knew the Jewish belief was that in three days, this spirit could come back in this body. But day four has come, which means it's impossible for him to come back from the dead. That's why Jesus waited four days. He wanted to prove to them, I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, can you believe that? Isn't that amazing? Now, in the story, in the story of both uh, the, the resurrection of Lazarus and in the story of the resurrection of Jesus, what is the central feature at the tomb? Come on, talk to me, somebody. The stone. Now, right there is about the size of an average rolling stone that would have been used in the time of Christ, what we call the Roman time. And this stone, as you can tell, would take a several men to move. You just can't roll that stone away. Now, when Jesus was, when the women were coming to the tomb, what did they say? What was their biggest concern? Talk to me, somebody. How are they going to roll away the stone? Here's a couple women, maybe three women, and here they are coming to this tomb. And I'm not going to do this right now while we're taping, but I'd like to see three women try to move that. I'd like to see just three men try to move. That is a heavy, heavy rock. Now, it will roll, but you have to have some leverage. And in fact, the one, listen to this, the one that was at the tomb of Jesus, it's estimated that it took up to 16 men maybe to even get to, because to, it's, it's it was a bigger one, a 16 men to actually move that, and there were certain things they had to do to move it. Now, in the time of Christ, oh, we got a lot of teaching here. In the time of Jesus, he's looking at the Pharisees, okay? And when he's looking at the Pharisees, he's calling them hypocrites, and here's what he said, you're nothing but a whited sepulcher full of dead men's bones. Now, whited, can everybody see the color of that? limestone. All of the limestone at every tomb you'll ever see in Israel is white limestone. But let me, let me tell you something else. It's not just the white limestone color that outwardly it looks clean or white, but inwardly it's got full of dead men's bones. But let me tell you something else they did. Prior to the Feast of Israel, when the men would come up to celebrate the feast, there was an assignment given to where they would whitewash the sepulchers. Okay, and what they would do is they would take, uh, they would t I don't know if they took water, I've never studied what they used, probably water or something in a brush, but they would clean all the dirt off and they would go around it and it made it look really white and really shiny. So when Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are a whited sepulcher full of dead men's bones, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about when they clean up the tomb for the feast and make it outwardly look beautiful, 
all it's good for is to put the bones of someone who's departed, okay? So how many of you are learning something right now? How many of you know it's a whole lot different to come here and learn it than it is watching it at home? Okay? Now, I'm going to give you another nugget here, and this is important that you understand this. When the man of Gadara was possessed with 2,000 demons, where did the demons come from? Answer, he was hanging out at the tombs. Now, watch carefully. When people died back in that day, and they did not embalm them, and they kept the blood in the body, the demonic spirits would hover near the body of someone that was not a believer. Meaning that when they saw that that person was not coming back and that was an empty shell, they would look for another body to go into. So the man of Gadara in Mark 5 being in a graveyard was getting filled with all these demons that had been in people. Is that a warfare teaching or what? I mean, is that a, is that a Satan's playbook war, warfare teaching? Wow. Now, when you, when you look at how the demonic powers in, in, uh, affected this man, you see that, that the man was cutting himself with stones. Really, he had a spirit of suicide on him. And the, when, when the demons came out of the man, they went into the swine, and the swine ran into a deep place uh, down into the sea. And, you know, I could get into a lot of warfare teaching here, but I won't do that because I want to kind of stay in the theme of what I feel like the Holy Spirit's given me. Now, I want to ex explain something to you that's very interesting. Let's go back to the burial in Jesus' day. If you were to die, God forbid, that's not going to happen. But if you were to die in Jesus' day, what they would do is they would wash your body down. You were not buried in a full set of clothes. They would wrap you up in linen and put spices on you, and they would stick you in the niche in this cave. You would stay buried in the niche in that cave for 12 months. At the end of 12 months, they go back in and pull the corpse out, and it's nothing but bone now. They unwrap the linen. They then wash it with wine and water and clean the bones up, and they put, put it in what's called an ossuary, which is a box. It's about, let's say, about that long, about that tall, about that wide. It can be cut out of limestone. Uh, most of them were cut out of limestone. And then they take the bones, and they put it in that ossuary, and then they take the ossuary and put it back in the niche. Now, by doing so, you can stack numerous bodies over the years in a family tomb. Now, I'm going to give you something. I researched this the other day. I'm, I'm, most of you know I'm working on a study Bible, and I've been preaching for 34 years, and I'm learning stuff working on a study Bible that just amazes me. And this is one of the things I learned. Ready? The, the body was put in, okay, buried 12 months later. 12, if I say 12 months later, 12 months later. it's put in a final box. Now, I'm going to read a verse to you that never made sense to me because I thought Jesus is really being... Well, I just thought he was being mean to the guy. And here's what it says. Another one of his disciples said to him, Lord, suffer me to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me, let the dead bury the dead. And I'm thinking, okay, that's cold. Now, Jesus, I know you love people. And I'm, I'm telling you, I said this for years, that is just cold. <clears throat> I mean, somebody's dad died. I mean, I, you know, I want to bury my dad. I don't want to, okay, you got to understand something. Listen, the man had died 12 months ago. The man was in the tomb. He was bones. Now they go through the whole ritual of 12 months later going in and pulling the bones back out and putting them in an ossuary. And Jesus is saying, let the dead bury the dead. Let those who deal with tombs take care of the bones. He wasn't saying don't go to your dad's funeral. See, we're Western thinking. We think he's talking about a funeral service. But he's talking about, look, you've had your burial You've honored your dad. Now you want to go back and leave me just to take care of the bones that's, a, that's 12 months old? Yeah. Oh, are you still hearing me now? Is that good teaching? Isn't that amazing? So sometimes you got to come here to Israel and you got to see things like this to understand. Now here's where we're going to go if we got the time in the next few moments. Jesus Christ, I believe, is raised from the dead. However, if you do not believe he's raised from the dead, you probably have several theories. And I want to give you, if I can get, I hope I have time to do this. I want to give you some of the theories that unbelievers have concerning the body of Jesus. Number one, there's a theory that says the body of Jesus was never placed in the tomb, but it remained on the cross. First of all, go to any law back in that day, study Jewish law. That is absolutely impossible because it was coming to the time of Passover. And they had to speed up the death process by breaking the legs of the thieves to get them off the cross, to get them buried. 
because you cannot have a person remaining on the cross. The Jews, therefore, because it was preparation that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was, not, was a high day, high holy day actually, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. When they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead and they break not his legs. Deuteronomy 21, 22 through 23, the law said a crucified person is not to remain on the tree. So by Jewish law, one, he cannot remain on the tree. Number two, he cannot remain on the tree during the time of Passover, that close. They've got to get him off. So the idea that he just remained on the tree and that's where he died and that was the end of it absolutely cannot be true. Number two, there are some that say that Jesus was never really crucified, but someone was crucified in Jesus' place. I have a lot of Muslim friends that live in Israel. We've discussed this before. And I said to them, what is your belief about Isaiah ben Maryam or Jesus, the son of Mary? And one of them said to me, he said, when we grew up in uh, reading the Quran and the Hadith and in Islam, we were taught that Jesus was never crucified, that someone was crucified in Jesus' place like Judas, and God made his countenance to look like Jesus. So therefore, in Islam, it, the belief is that Christ was never crucified, that someone simply took Christ's place. Now, in the Quran, there's mentioning there that no man is able to stand before God. Now, we know even in the, in the Scripture, it talks about men not being able to, you know, uh, approaching the, the light that no man can approach where God dwells. And I asked a Muslim friend of mine one time this question, and those of you watching me maybe that are Muslim, maybe this is something to think about. I said, if we believe and you believe that no man is able to stand in God's presence, right? Yes. And, that, and I said, but you told me that Jesus was never crucified, but that God brought Jesus up to heaven and rebuked him, this is the Islamic belief, for saying, you are my son, don't you know I don't have a son? So in the last days, God is going to send Jesus back to earth to tell everybody that he was not the son of God, that he lied. I said, now, I said, now in your Islamic belief, am I right by saying that you believe that Jesus went to heaven? Yes. That God did not crucify him? Yes. That he's in heaven now? Yes. He will return one day? Yes. But he's not the son of God? That's right. He's just a man. I said, then how can your teaching say it is impossible for a man to stand in God's presence? And I, I never forget the guy we were eating. He goes, oh my God. <laughs> It really, you, you were, uh, Robert was there, I'm pointing to Robert, the head of Knows Where to Travel. And so it really was amazing because it's like the light bulb went out. And I said, now, if he is standing in front of God, okay, and if he's not being consumed as we believe and you believe maybe he would be if he were just a mortal man, then that means he can't be just another mortal man. He has to be something above and beyond. And I never forget it. He just looked at me and he said, Oh my God, it's like it clicked. So I do, let me say something to you. In the scripture, Jesus himself had to die. Jesus himself had to be raised from the dead. God never replaced him for someone else, okay? Now, let me look at the third one or share with you the third one. This is one that was taught some time ago. It's called the, the swoon theory. The belief is that Jesus bled, now this is the swoon theory, from the third to the ninth hour for a total of six hours. When they brought him off the cross, his heart was still beating, very weak. They went to put him in the tomb and he crawled out of the tomb and the soldiers put the stone over the tomb thinking that he was inside the tomb. So when the, when the stone was rolled away somehow, there's no body inside the tomb. So Jesus swooned somewhere and they took Jesus and he eventually recovered and he eventually died. That's about like believing in evolution. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does God created the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> I mean, that is an absolute complicated theory because <clears throat> Jesus Christ died, and I can prove he died, because the Bible said there was a centurion that took a sword and put it in his heart, and out came blood and water. And anybody here who's a doctor, because we have a gentleman over here that works in the medical profession, knows that when the, when the blood and the water come out together from the piercing of the heart, it's the sack of the heart where all the blood and waters come to the bottom of the heart. You're going to be dead. That has killed you. And so Jesus Christ died on the cross. But the thing I want to tell you is he didn't just die. He raised from the dead. We were here several years ago in Israel. And the question came up where someone asked me, they said, how do you know that what you believe is true? And I said, I thought for a moment. I said, well, that's a good question. That's a fair question. And I said, I know what I believe is true because of the power of change. How can the gospel be preached in 50 minutes at a service or a church or a crusade or a meeting? 
and all of a sudden a person's life is changed forever. How can you go to a foreign country where they've never heard the gospel, preach a 30-minute message, and people's lives are changed forever? So it's the power of change. Someone then said, well, there is no one living that actually saw Jesus raised from the dead, so how can you believe it? I thought about that. I said, Peter's dead, Mary's dead, John's dead, and I went down the list of everybody that was dead, and then all of a sudden I got quickened. I said, no, that's where you're wrong. There is someone who was there at the resurrection who's still here. There was someone that saw him get up from the tomb who is still here. There's someone who brought him out of the grave clothes who is still here, and that's the Holy Spirit. Ah, yes, it is. Because the Bible said the Spirit of God raised up Jesus from the dead, and if the Spirit that dwells in Christ dwell in you, come on, somebody, it shall also quicken your mortal body. And so I'm excited to come from Nazareth Village here. And if you ever get the opportunity, if you're going to Holy Land tour, you've got to come here. This is a fabulous place. The group's getting ready to tour it, and they're going to be in, they're going to be in the third heaven when it's over with, I'm telling you, because this is just like it was in Jesus' day. And the neat thing is, it's in Nazareth, guys. You're here. Come on, can you believe it? You're here. You're where Jesus was raised. You're here on these hills. Oh, I'm going to pass out and fall over a rock. Glory to God, there's rocks everywhere in this place. But Christ walked on these hills. But most of all, when I see that stone rolled away, I'm reminded he's not in the tomb. He's risen. The king is risen and he's alive. So my, my encouragement to you is follow the Lord and serve him. God bless you. Amen, somebody. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.